Imbeni malaika Sifaza Yesu buana Wekeli metukuka Jina lake Yesu Thank you for joining us again on Real Biblical Application. Uh, we're starting off a new year with special guest Clint DeFrance. This is really, I guess, season two. It's year two of the podcast. And Clint has come on to talk about uh, John chapter 20, or 4, verse 24, where it says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So we're going to kind of center our studies around this one verse, but also look at the surrounding verses for context. Uh, Clint, we usually start by uh, the guests giving an introduction uh, of themselves. And so would you have anything to say about yourself as far as introductions, so people know who you are? Maybe you can mention the search as well. Well, my name is uh, Clinton DeFrance. I'm a preacher in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I work with two congregations here, an English-speaking congregation and a Chukis-speaking Micronesian congregation. And in addition to my local work here, I am involved with two podcast programs, actually. Uh, one called Verse by Verse, which is an expository teaching podcast where I'm working through the Book of Acts. And the other is called The Search that I do with Shahi Jurgen, who I know has been on your program before. And in that uh, podcast and the video portion that we put on YouTube, we talk about Bible study principles in general and how to cultivate a better skill set and better habits as Bible students to encourage an honest search for biblical truth. So, a lot of the same spirit that drives your own podcast, uh, driving all of the works that I'm involved in, I'm happy to be a part of this. I appreciate the invitation. One of the things you're studying, you and Shahi are discussing on the search right now, is the idea of uh, having an open heart, uh, also having an open Bible. And I believe the third, if I remember correctly, was having open time or open time schedule. And this was talking about the Bereans having these three things. And I found it very uh, convicting myself about having an open heart. because I think that's very important. Uh, we can get in this mindset that we've studied verses and we think that we've got it all figured out. And it causes us to not be open to other interpretations or other ideas of verses. And this verse that we're talking about today kind of falls in line in that for me, because I thought I had this verse all figured out. Now, something about this verse has always tugged at me, I would say, because the context that I've been given for this verse, not the context, but the interpretation I've been given for this verse previously, <clears throat> I've always thought that that interpretation was strange in the context but I could never put my finger on why it was strange because I had been taught that this verse meant A and that's how I had always looked at it was through the lens of A. I had my A sunglasses on whenever I viewed this verse and I didn't question it. And through further study and discussion with you and others, I've come to a different interpretation. And so that's why I've asked you to come on and discuss it because it was helpful to me and I hope it'll be helpful to others. So whenever you study the Bible, you have a, a pattern that you want to follow whenever you study. Uh, I believe you put it in, in three steps. What are those three steps that you like to follow whenever you study the Bible? So the three steps that I encourage and that I learned, found very helpful, are called the three steps of the inductive Bible study method. This means that uh, when we come to the Bible, we don't assume that we are carrying uh, sufficient knowledge with ourselves to come and interact with what we find in the Bible. But we are coming to a book that has in it things that are not in, our, in us. They're not in our own minds. So understanding the Bible will not be intuitive. We won't be able to bring our world, our culture, our presuppositions, 
and interpret the Bible the way we would interpret things in our regular surroundings because the Bible is very different from our world, our culture, and our presuppositions. It's a very ancient book, originally written in another language, another part of the world. It was written for us. I do believe that. But it wasn't written to us. And so it takes some extra effort to overcome the gaps or the uh, spaces between us and its meaning. <clears throat> so the process by which that overcoming takes place is these three steps of observation, interpretation, and application. Of course, for your podcast, the great interest is in biblical application, how to take the Bible and have our lives be transformed by it. But the inductive Bible study method challenges us that you cannot apply a text until you have first interpreted it and understood what it means. And you cannot interpret a text until you have first carefully observed it and understood what it says and the world, both literary, historical, and uh, theological, in which it appears. I think our human nature when we open the Bible is to jump to application. Mm. Um, but when I think about whenever I first started teaching, I didn't have anyone to teach me how to make a sermon. Someone asked me um, to come speak for them one Sunday. It was a small congregation. I had never given a lesson before, and it was on a Sunday morning. They just asked me because I made videos such as the ones that are on this, um, this podcast uh, just on my Facebook page. And someone said, hey, will you come speak for us by seeing those videos? And so I didn't know what I was doing. And so what I did was probably what many millennials do and maybe Gen Zers now. Is that the most recent generation, Gen Z? I think so. Uh, something like that. <laughs> uh, but you go to Google and you say something like this. I want to make a sermon on faith. And on the first thing that's going to pop up is some websites that have verses that mention the word faith. And so I'm going to take verses that say faith in them, and I'm going to try to string some of them together to preach a concept and just pluck these verses out of the Bible without even examining the context. Um, and that was my method of doing it. So every, week, every time I was asked to speak, I'd be like, okay, I want to write a sermon on prayer. And I would type in verses on prayer. And that would come up, a bunch of verses on prayer, and I would try to string them together without even looking at context. And in, in my studies on things like faith, I have found that you can't even do that because faith isn't always the same in every context. And so you can't get a full picture without looking at context. Mm. And so it's very dangerous to be doing things like that. And that just speaks to this idea that we just want to jump to application rather than look at the context and study it out. I didn't become a good Bible student until I started doing chapter studies. Mm. My congregation would start asking me to do chapter studies. And I'll be like, wait, I have all these sermons. I have this great sermon on faith. I have this great sermon on prayer. I want to give those sermons. But they, they asked me to speak on a chapter. And at first, I, I didn't like it. I wanted to give these sermons that I'd already worked hard to create. But it forced me to study the Bible within context. And it forced me to become a Bible student instead of a, a Bible Googler, we might say. <laughs> and I never grew more in my understanding of the Bible than I did when I started doing chapter studies. It forced me to understand what I was, what I was teaching. Um, and now that's the majority of my teaching is just, I open a chapter, I open a section of verses, and we just go through them until we understand them. And so let's start in this study with, I'll tell you some ways that I've used this verse in the past. And then we're, we'll kind of dive into the context of this verse, and we'll try to understand it more fully. So the way I was taught this verse historically growing up, and I'm sure it may be the same for you because we have similar upbringing, was that whenever Jesus is talking, let me start in verse 23 of John 4. 
It says, The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So really what we're trying to hone in on here is what does Jesus mean when he says spirit and truth? And what I've understood these verses to mean up until recently was when it's talking about spirit, it's talking about our attitude. It's talking about the reverence that we need to have in worship, maybe the sincerity that we need to have in worship and our our posture. And then the, the truth was that we needed to worship God in the pattern that he has set forth for his worship. And oftentimes you would connect this with like Nadab and Abihu uh, struck down for getting the fire from the wrong place. And God obviously wants us to worship God in the pattern that he has set forth. And so I always looked at these verses and said, okay, he wants us to follow the true pattern, or maybe we'd say the correct mechanics in our worship. Um, so, That has been my interpretation. Has that been your interpretation or what other interpretations have you heard in regards to these verses? Yeah, for a long time, for sure. That was my uh, understanding. You have two aspects of worship here. Worshiping in spirit, basically meaning worshiping with sincerity or with your heart, your mind. People might think of being joyful and committed, serious when you come to worship. And then worshiping in truth is the actions, the formulas, the rituals you go through, making sure that it's the the Bible way and not a way of human imagination or invention. And I used to hear people, for instance, say, you know, we, we're we really good at worshiping in truth, but we're not so good at worshiping in spirit. And some people out there in the religious world, they're good at worshiping in spirit, but they're not so good at worshiping in truth. Mm-hmm. And people would often put the emphasis on and, worship in spirit and in truth. And they would pray that God would help us so that we would most certainly worship today in spirit and in truth. Now, later I began to find uh, commentators, particularly at first, who understood this to have some reference to the Holy Spirit and to his work in the life of the believer. And then later, I also even heard a couple of gospel preachers from, you know, within my own community uh, talking about worshiping in spirit as some kind of uh, worshiping with your spirit. And it was something a little bit more metaphysical. It wasn't so much attitude or disposition, but it still was always being Uh, contrasted with worship in truth. You have these two concepts, spirit and truth, that are distinct, and they're joined together as both of equal importance, and they have a relationship with each other. And what I have come to realize as I have looked at the context of this passage, and at the larger context in the Gospel of John, as well as the context in the conversation, is that those concepts that I was hearing preached from this verse may well be right. In fact, I think all of them are correct. But we have to be careful not to preach the right sermon with the wrong scripture. Mm. And the reason for that is not just a matter of uh, intellectual snootiness, that you always want to be right and better than everyone else. It's that if we are misusing this scripture, even if we're misusing it to teach something that's true, whatever the scripture actually teaches, we're missing. And it might even be a hole in our knowledge that is significant and has real bearing on on our faith. Uh, It's good that we know what we do know, But we really want to know, what does this passage actually teach? And that really is is, uh, the emphasis that I want to drive here. I I don't think that the way that I've heard the passage used represented what we would call, you know, false teaching or destructive, heretical uh, ideas that were opposed to Christian system or something like that. 
they were true notions that are taught in many other parts of the Bible, but this was the wrong scripture for the right sermon. I've also heard it described, and maybe this is a little bit closer, actually, that the and should be removed, not should be removed, but what they do the way when they describe it, they say that we worship truly spiritual. So they, they instead of spirit and truth, they say it's, it's essentially the same thing as truly spiritual. Um, and I don't really know exactly what they meant by that. They didn't describe it to me. Um, but that was just another interpretation that I heard. Uh, and, and surface, it doesn't se- seem too bad to me, but I would like to start uh, with the context here and kind of dive into that. And then we can kind of dive into the view of what we believe this is, what Jesus is teaching from the context. Where would you like to start whenever we, we start looking at the context of what Jesus is saying here? Well, when we're talking about context, we're in our first stage of our three-step process in observation. We're trying to survey the landscape uh, in which this passage appears. And so we could talk about the historical context. We could talk about the theological context or the literary context. Uh, This passage appears within the Gospel of John. Of course, originally, the Gospel of John wasn't divided up into chapters and verses. It was one book. And it was the book of the Gospel of John that was received as the inspired Word of God and brought into the New Testament canon by the ancient believers. So that is the most basic contextual unit that our text appears in, is the book of the Gospel of John. Well, I want to point out some things that I think might not be necessarily appreciated by many readers in the Gospel of John, Uh, but we're going to see some pretty interesting examples of how Jesus is being contrasted with the old system. And when I say the old system, primarily I mean the old Jewish system that was given to Israel through Moses. uh, And what was the point of that system? Back in John chapter 1, John tells us that the lagos, the the reason and purpose and wisdom and power of God, is not a philosophical system like the Greeks thought, nor is it the law of Moses like many of the Jews thought. It is a person, and the person is Jesus of Nazareth. So he calls Jesus the Word, the lagos. And in John chapter 1, verse 14, he says, the Word who was in the beginning with God and who had the same nature as God and who created the world and who is light and life and who gives glory and breath and power and purpose to all things, that word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then he goes on to say, as you read on through John 1, 14 through 18, he says that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And he says, of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Now, these texts can be a little difficult and a little confusing in their own part, But I believe what uh, John is saying is that throughout history, as God has revealed himself to humanity through prophets and through the ancient patriarchs, the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and through institutions and systems like the tabernacle and the temple and some of the great things that God set up throughout the history of Israel, he demonstrated his love, his benevolence, his mercy, his graciousness, his faithfulness, his sincerity and honesty and glory. But that has come to us more abundantly than it ever came to anyone before, because we have learned those things and seen them and received them through Jesus Christ, 
who is the embodiment of God's very person. And that's what John 1.18 says, that no one has truly understood God. That's, he says no one has seen God. But really the, the idea is no one has truly known or understood God throughout history. They've seen glimpses, shadowy images, representations of him. But the only begotten Son, the, the one and only unique Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was in the bosom of the Father, has revealed him to us. So we have grace upon grace. We have in fullness what was only revealed partially in the old systems. This is very important because this section, the prologue to the Gospel of John, is setting the tone that we're supposed to keep in mind as we read through the rest of the book. John is going to make several contrasts between the old system and Jesus to show that Jesus is better. Jesus is the fulfillment of what the old system pointed toward. The old system passes away when he comes on the scene because he is the fullness of it and much better than it. So you see some examples uh, in, for instance, John 1 51 with the calling of Apostle Nathaniel, where Jesus says to Nathaniel, You are a true Israelite in whom there is no guile. This is an interesting word play because the word guile or deception or deceit is uh, the literal meaning of Israel's original name, Jacob. So it's basically he's saying to Nathaniel, you are all Israel and no Jacob. You represent what God was trying to make of his people. And then he says something that points back to an event in Jacob, old patriarch Jacob's life. You remember when Jacob was at Bethel and he had the dream of the ladder that came down from heaven and there were angels climbing up and down the ladder. Jesus says to Nathanael, you will see the heavens opened and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So what he's saying here is, I am the true ladder that has come down from heaven. I am the real bridge between heaven and earth. I am what Jacob only dreamed about. So right here at the very start, we have this glorious contrast between Jesus Christ and this old treasured thing from Israelite history, that the old thing was just a picture. Jesus is the reality. Similarly, when we get to John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, we have a rather notorious statement that he makes after he cleanses the temple of its corruption. And he makes the statement that if you destroy this temple, I'll build it again in three days. And we learn that he's talking about his body here. But really what he's saying is he is the temple. He is the true uh, dwelling place of God on earth. And that building in Jerusalem was a picture that was pointing forward to his work. Now he's on the scene and he is greater than the temple. So we have this contrast. He is the true ladder come down from heaven. He is the true temple. Then in John 3, verses 14 through 15, he brings up another Old Testament story uh, in his conversation with Nicodemus. This time, the raising of the bronze serpent when the Israelites had rebelled against God during the wilderness wandering and they were bitten by fiery serpents. They were dying. Uh, Moses was to raise up a bronze image of a serpent on a pole, and those who looked at the serpent would live. Jesus says, as Moses raised up the serpent of the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And he says, the ones who look at me by faith, the ones who turn to me and give their allegiance to me, uh, they will have everlasting life, and they will not perish as the world around them is perishing. So what we've seen here is the first three chapters of John, we're going to be looking at John 4, but the first three chapters have already demonstrated this motif of a contrast between the old system and the work of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the new and better way which brings to fulfillment 
what the old system symbolized and illustrated. That is, we can call this sort of the literary context of the Gospel of John. John's telling us a story, and he's let us know already what to be looking for as we read the story. I have a little bit more, but uh, anything that you want to yeah. say about that? Well, of course, John's uh, gospel here is known for all the I am statements. I am this, I am that. And you're pointing out the contrast that Jesus is making uh, or that John is making about Jesus throughout. Why is John spending so much time making these contrasts between the old and the new? Uh, who is the audience that he's trying to reach out to with this letter? Or is it because of the intended audience? Or why is he doing this? I think I think it is because of the intended audience. And again, you know, he opens up with that discussion of that concept of logos, the word. That concept, which had its roots, uh, particularly in Greek philosophy, had come into Jewish thinking during the days of Alexander the Great. But the Greek philosophers, when they thought about the logos, they thought about something that could be access through philosophy or through the occult or through nature. You, you learn the, the meaning of life and the rational principle that governs all of life. The Jewish rabbis took that word and they said, no, it's not philosophy. It is the law of Moses. It is the system that God gave Israel in the temple, the priesthood, and the experiences that Israel has had throughout her history, that is the Lagos of God. And John is trying to say, no, the Lagos of God is neither the philosophy of the Greeks nor the law of the Jews. It is Jesus. Jesus is the Lagos of God. One of the ways he's showing that is by demonstrating how everything in the history of Israel that they might take glory in, and look at with, uh, you know, a, a heart of, of joy and, and fullness and say, look at how God favored us as a people. John is saying that was just a picture, just a symbol of Jesus. Jesus is bringing the reality. So let me read the verses kind of leading up to what we're going to discuss and ask you another question. Um, I'm going to start in verse 19. This is John chapter 4. And I'm going to read 19 through 24. The woman, and this woman, by the way, is the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus has been having a conversation with her. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people, that is the Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so we have an interesting conversation here. I'm not going to dive into the conversation. I'm just going to ask this question. This is a woman who is a Samaritan woman that he's talking to. So my question is, what is a Samaritan? That's an important question, very important part of our context. Now we're getting into sort of historical context. So the Samaritans were a people group who came to live in Judea, Palestine area, the land of Israel, <clears throat> after the Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and carried away those people into captivity and, and took them to live in a diaspora uh, in other lands. They moved other peoples into the place where Israel had formerly lived. Mm. We read about this in the book of Second Kings. And these folks who were brought in to live there, they were pagans. And what they discovered when they started living in the land was they did not know the God who was over that land. It's important to know that they were 
what you call a henotheist. So they believe there was a different God for every territory or geographical oh, okay. region. So they thought, well, there's a God who is worshipped here, but we don't know him. And there were lions that lived there that were very powerful and they were killing everybody. So they contacted the king of Assyria and said, we don't, we don't know how to uh, please the God who lives here. And whoever he is, he's sending these lions to eat all of us. So we need some help in knowing this God and worshiping him. So the king of Assyria sent a Levite to go and teach them about Yahweh. And he did, and he introduced, you know, uh, Jewish blood into their, their people, at least a little bit of it. But what they did is the Bible says they, they served Yahweh, they feared Yahweh, but they also worshipped other gods. So they were polytheists for a long period of time. Now, when Nehemiah and Ezra uh, lead the homecoming after Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom, the people who lived up here tried to help rebuild the temple, but they were told that it was not for them. And there's different ways of interpreting that. Were Nehemiah and Ezra right in excluding them, or were they wrong? Uh, I'm not exactly sure the best way to read some of those narratives, but there was an animosity that was ever after present between the Jewish people who had come back from Babylon and lived in their land in the south, and the Samaritans who lived up hmm. north of them. The Samaritans, because they were not allowed to help rebuild uh, the temple, they built their own temple on Mount Gerizim, and they developed a little bit of mythology about it. They claimed that uh, that temple had been built by Jacob himself. They had some ideas uh, about it that were you know, unscriptural and in fact, unhistorical, but that began to define them as a people. They even wrote their own Bible, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and they changed aspects of the Pentateuch that would have given favor to the Jews. They edited it to give favor to themselves. And there was all kinds of feuding where they would desecrate each other's temples and uh, I think they desecrated the Jerusalem temple with uh, sprinkling bones through the courtyard, and the Jews came up and destroyed their Gerizim temple. So there were religious, serious religious feuds between the Samaritans and the Jews. The reason that they hated each other was because of these years and years of feuding and strong religious disagreement. But the Samaritans had developed a religion that was based on at least certain Jewish texts and Jewish concepts. They believed in Messiah, although they expected him to just be a great teacher. They weren't necessarily looking him, at him to be a, a military leader, but a great teacher who would solve all disputes and answer all theological questions and things like that. They had a name for him that escapes me at the, the present moment, but uh, it was a little bit different from the Jewish uh, name. But these divisions became so severe in the time of Jesus that most Jews wouldn't even walk through Samaria. And of course, there's a little bit of a, of a situation here in the Gospel of John where Jesus intentionally goes into Samaria. He rests at this well, Jacob's well, that Jacob himself had dug a long time ago. He sends his disciples away. He knows that this woman is coming. And he wants to meet her. He knows all about her because, of course, he's Jesus. And he has a conversation with her, which is amazing. You know, not only is she a woman, and they don't normally, men don't normally talk to women in this culture, uh, but she also is a Samaritan, and he's a Jew. And this comes up in the course of their discussion. But he talks to her about water using the well as an analogy. And he, he promises to her living water, which really just properly means flowing water as opposed to the stagnant water of a well or something like that. Uh, but he doesn't really explain what living water means here. He says that if you drink of the living water, he can give you a never thirst again. So something extraordinary. Later in John 7, verses 37 through 39, he talks about this again. And he tells us that living water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. 
or the kingdom of God. That it's a it's a symbol of God's final work to bring renewal to humanity and to his creation of salvation uh, for all peoples. So he's offering her, when he offers her living water, he's offering her participation in the kingdom of God that she doesn't understand. And of course, in the, in the process of their conversation, um, he says some things to her that uh, cause her to become upset. And she realizes this is no ordinary man. This, this man seems to be a prophet. So she, she asks him a theological question. And this is the principal question of dispute between Samaritans and Jews. They fought about a lot of things, but the primary contention between them was where you should worship. Remember, they had been excluded from helping rebuild Solomon's temple after the captivity, and they built their own temple. So when she says that our fathers say on this mountain you should worship, she means the Samaritan temple, Mount Gerizim. You Jews say it ought to be in Jerusalem. Which one is right? That's the implied question here. And uh, that's important. That's, that's the context. That's what opens up this discussion. Now, I do want to point out some things. We've, we've looked at some historical context and some literary context, but now as the, as the conversation begins to unfold and we want to look at the specific wording, then we want to make some grammatical observations. First, this little phrase, an hour is coming, and now is. Well, first he says an hour is coming, and then he repeats that, an hour is coming, and now is. Now, you don't want to skip over phrases like that. Those phrases give shape and meaning to a conversation. And an hour is coming, that kind of has a prophetic, forward-looking ring to it. It's like he's saying a big change is on the rise. Something radical is about to happen. But then he says, and now is, which would indicate not only is it about to happen, it's getting started right here. It reminds me of um, Jesus. You know, the kingdom was described as something that was at hand. It was also described as something that was in their midst. It was in their presence. And this it seems similar. It's it's coming, but now is. It's at hand, but it's in your midst. Yes, yes uh, absolutely. So it's very similar language to the kingdom talk that we see Jesus and John the Baptist employ. That's right. And I think that, in fact, we're going to find that's exactly what he's talking about. But, but we know this, that when he uses terms like an hour is coming and now is, it lets us know something big is about to happen, a change, mm -hmm. something different. He says an hour is coming and now is when no longer will people worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem. But something different is going to happen. God is going to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So whatever it means to worship God in spirit and in truth, we observe that it is the opposite of going to worship him in a temple. Hmm. This immediately lets us know it would be very strange if he's talking about, you know, sincerity and, and right forms and rituals, because under the old system, uh, going to the Jerusalem temple was the right form. Mm -hmm. That was the one God had ordained. In fact, Jesus acknowledged that. He says, you don't know what you worship, you Samaritans. Salvation is of the Jews. That's a way of saying, you're wrong and the Jews are right, right now. Mm -hmm. But the time is coming when this controversy will become irrelevant. And whatever worshiping in spirit and truth means, it means not worshiping in physical temples. That's going to be the biggest consequence of it. And it has something to do with God's spiritual nature. God is spirit. Right. Therefore, those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, we've, we've talked about the popular interpretation that spirit and truth means attitude and action. Attitude or sincerity and obedience or something like that. But if that is what Jesus meant, that's not a change. That's not something new that he brought. 
God has always demanded sincerity and obedience. I want to give some passages from the Old Testament, and maybe if you wouldn't mind reading them for us. Sure. Joshua 24, verse 14. Verse 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. That sounds very familiar. Yeah, there you go. And, and, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Okay, now look to 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. And finally, Isaiah 29, verse 13. Then the Lord said, "Because this people draw near with me, uh, because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote." So what all these passages show is that throughout Israel's history, from the days of the judges through the days of the prophets and the monarchy. God always was commanding Israel to worship him sincerely with their whole heart. Mm -hmm. He did not want them to come near with their mouths and their hearts to be far away. He did not accept that. That kind of worship was detestable to him all along. That's not a New Testament thing. That's not some radical change that Jesus brought. I think some people really think it is. I think some people think that in the Old Testament, God only asked for obedience. And he didn't ask for people's hearts, that that's, that's a New Testament concept. Not so. Not so. Mm -hmm. God has always demanded the heart of the worshiper and a person who gave him sacrifices and incense and offerings and ritual without sincerity. God found that detestable. He hated that. And he punished people for that. And in fact, most of the critique that the prophets give against Israelite worship is not that they worshiped with the wrong rituals, but that they worshiped with the wrong heart, mm. that they didn't really love God, and their interior spirit did not match their exterior uh, formulas and, and rituals in the temple. So whatever Jesus means, he can't mean what we've historically heard. He can't mean the time is now coming when God is going to have people worship him with the right attitude in the right way, because God has always demanded that. That's not new. But what Jesus is talking about is something new. Spirit and truth means something new, something that's radical, something that's going to result in you not having to go to the temple anymore. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've made some observations, and it's prepared us for... Uh, getting right into the text. Before I get into interpretation, is there anything that you uh, would like to say or ask about what I've mentioned so far? No, I would just note um, the very first command of the Ten Commandments is love the Lord your God. Mm. And that itself, he's, when he's saying love God, he's not just saying that we need to just do these mechanical actions. So to say that that was all that was required under the old law would just be silly. This is the first law. This is later said to be the greatest command that God desires a, a love and he desires that love to be the motivation, that, that sincerity to be the motivation of why they did what they did, why they would bring their sacrifices and why they would make offering in the temple and why they would do what they did. They wanted the motivation to be love for God. And so sincerity was always first and foremost, I would say, yeah. in the heart of what God expected of his people. That's right. That's right. And that's very important for us to understand. There are theological concepts that have developed throughout the years that act as though there was no grace in the Old Testament, there was only law, and there was no uh, sincerity required, only ritual, only obedience. This causes people to think of obedience as an Old Testament concept, sincerity as a New Testament concept. Not true at all. Hmm. Obedience is a New Testament concept. 
And sincerity is an Old Testament concept. Those are just <laughs> fundamental aspects of, of a relationship with God uh, inherent to all periods of time. So I think this, now that we've made these in, these observations about the context, literary and historical, and some key grammatical phrases that have sort of opened our mind to what's going on, we can do an exegesis and uh, really begin to interpret the text. So I'll uh, begin reading here in John 4, verse 19. And we'll just walk through the passage quickly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, that would be Mount Gerizim, but uh, you Jews or you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, there's no question here, the way that it appears in our Bible, it's just a statement, but there are implied questions. We saw this even in the conversation with Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher sent from God, but no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. He never asks a question, but Jesus answers a question <laughs> that he knows was sort of implied by the statement. Similarly here, there's a question implied of the statement. The, the uh, implied question is, which mountain is right? And Jesus said to her, verse 21, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Something interesting, not the answer she was expecting, I'm sure. Verse 22 is the direct answer to her question. You worship what you do not know. That is, you worship in ignorance. You, your worship is misguided. You have contrived for yourself a system of worship that did not come from God. We, that is the Jews, worship what we know. We worship what God has given us, for salvation is from the Jews. That is, God chose these people, and he has revealed himself to them. So the implication of this text is the Jews are right. It is the temple in Jerusalem. That was the one that was built under the direction of God himself, according to God's pattern, and where God's presence was manifest. Now, it doesn't seem to be there anymore. But it was there a long time ago. It never was in the Gerizim temple. That was uh, never a temple that God was involved with. But verse 23 says, An hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The implication here, when we tie God is spirit to no more need for temples, is that God's spiritual nature is opposed to the physical system of the temple. The temple belongs to the old, symbolic, typical institution. And that institution was meaningful. It taught a valuable lesson. But it never was what, what, what was necessary. It was, it was never the fullness. And even Solomon, who built the temple, knew that. In 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27, when Solomon is praying the dedication prayer at the temple, he says, will, will you, God, dwell here on earth in this house that I've built? He says, the heavens and the heavens of the heavens couldn't contain you. This house can't contain you. So Solomon acknowledges his glorious, luxurious temple was not adequate for a spirit like God. The whole trajectory of the Bible is pointing to a different kind of temple, an arrangement where God is not going to live in one little uh, city, in one little land, and everybody's going to have to come up there to meet him, but where God will dwell with all mankind throughout the whole earth. And if you really want to see the best sermon ever preached on this subject, go to Acts chapter 7. This is the heart and soul of Stephen's sermon, mm -hmm. where he shows God's presence and God's work all over the place outside of Israel. He shows how the Jews themselves 
had basically turned the temple into an idol and had forgotten what it was supposed to illustrate and, and had missed the lesson that it was supposed to teach them. The lesson being that the time was coming when God's temple would be something much greater than the building built by Solomon. So it's in this context that Jesus says we must worship God in spirit and in truth. And this leads me to the conclusion that spirit and truth does not mean the right attitude in the right way, but rather spirit means spiritual or spiritually, and uh, that is the opposite of fleshly or physical. The old worship in the tabernacle, in the temple, was called fleshly ordinances. In uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, the writer of Hebrews talks about the tabernacle, and he describes various aspects of, of its ordinances of divine service, he says in Hebrews 9, 1 and 2. And then after he goes through what all was involved in the tabernacle and later temple service, he says that was symbolic for the present time. And then he says in the present time, we have something that is better, that is not concerned with fleshly ordinances. I think the New American Standard Version says uh, regulations for the body. And the footnote would say regulations for the flesh. One translation says fleshly ordinances. And that's very helpful. What is the opposite of worshiping in spirit? Worshiping in flesh. It's not worshiping in uh, insincerity, it's worshiping in flesh, fleshly ordinances, which were the kind of rituals and ordinances of the temple, washing dirt from the body, offering blood and flesh in fire and in smoke, burning incense, and that kind of stuff. Uh, that's going to go away, and it's going to be replaced with something that is spiritual. And then truth is not the opposite of lying or uh, doing something that is you know, contrary to God's will, but in this case, truth is the opposite of symbolic. In Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, the writer of Hebrews talks about the true tabernacle, which the Lord built and not man. Now, the old tabernacle wasn't evil. It was just symbolic. Hmm. But God has now pitched the true tabernacle, which is the Christian system, the system of reconciliation through the work of Jesus Christ. Again, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, could you read this passage for me? 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 5. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as, as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus, uh, through Jesus Christ. So here we go. We don't have the old temple in Jerusalem anymore. Now we are a spiritual house. We don't offer animals on an altar anymore with blood and flesh and fire and smoke. Now we offer spiritual sacrifices through Jesus Christ. So spirit and truth is not two distinct things. It is uh, grammatically, this is a, a term that might be new to some people, but the term is called a hindiades. And that's where you can have the word and, but it's not two distinct things, it's two synonymous things. Um, there's a lot of Hindiades in, in poetry, like, uh, I don't know, the only one I can think of is so old-timey. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's <laughs> ever heard Vim and Vinegar, Sound and Fury, Sound and Fury. Some people might recognize that from, I think, Shakespeare, Sound and Fury. And these are just two words that are intended to be synonymous to mean the same thing. And they're joined together with and for emphasis. Mm. So to worship God in spirit and in truth, simply means this. You worship God in the reality rather than in the symbol. Mm. You worship God in what God intended all along, 
rather than in the old illustration that was designed to point in that direction. So spirit and truth means Christ, New Testament, as opposed to symbol and physicality in Moses and the Old Testament. That's basically what it means. So the application, God has always required the right attitude and submission to his instructions. That's nothing new. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't cause that to start happening. It was always the case, and it's still the case. Indeed, God still demands that we obey his commandments. The very essence of being a Christian is submitting to King Jesus. And God still demands that we have a heart for him and not just external rituals. Anyone who, right. who listens to the teachings of Jesus for very long sees that as kind of a, a continual refrain in them. But through Christ, God has changed the nature of worship in this way. Now, God's people do not journey to a temple in some land. We are the temple of God. And the Spirit of God dwells in us, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says. We do not offer flesh and blood through fire. Our lives are consecrated to God as a spiritual sacrifice. Our whole purpose, everything we do in life, is an offering, a sacrifice to God, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. And one of the reasons why we pay very close attention to covenantal distinctions. And we ask the question, is this passage in the Old Testament or is it in the New Testament? Mm -hmm. And if we find that there is a difference or a divergence between Old Testament teaching and New Testament teaching, we go with the new instead of the old, is because of passages like this. Spirit and truth means New Testament worship. Uh, I think you put that very well. And I think one of the most telling things from what you described is when Jesus says the hour is coming and now is, uh, he is describing a change. And you showed very well that throughout John's gospel, he is illustrating a change from the old to the new. And so in these verses, he's doing the same. And it wouldn't make sense for him to say something like sincerity and mechanics is the way I usually put it, but mm -hmm. uh, because it was always required. Right. Uh, the time is coming and now is when nothing is going to change at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Uh, so so I, think, I think this interpretation makes a lot of sense, um, especially in the context, not the context, but if you read Hebrews 8 and 9, mm -hmm. you see this very clearly come forth from the text, the contrast between the old and new. Now, I have a question about this new temple. Now, we we see imagery of God entering this temple. We, we have context that we are the temple ourselves. Some people will say that the congregation is the temple. What is the nature of this new temple, um, and how would God enter it and it also be in us? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that the, the temple imagery is really deep and uh, very significant in the telling of the Bible story. At this stage in the unfolding of God's work, his people through Jesus Christ are his temple. That means that God dwells on earth in and through his people, and he is working in and through his people to transform the world mm -hmm. by bringing others to him, manifesting his glory, revealing his will, uh, disseminating his grace and mercy, uh, showing his wisdom, all of the things that the rituals of the old tabernacle and temple were designed to do are now done in our lives as the people of God. That includes our corporate worship in the church, for sure. And there's some very significant aspects of that that play into this theme. But it's not just that. It's our whole life. It's, it's everything that you do as a Christian, everything I do as a Christian, 
and everything we do as a community of believers uh, locally and throughout the whole earth, or the great congregation of all of Christ's people in all the nations. And that, of course, that's the reason why this was good news to the Samaritan woman. It wouldn't necessarily have been good news to her to say, the hour is coming when you better do exactly what God says and you better mean it. Hmm. Well, that's first of all, that's always been the case, but that was the Samaritan's problem. They were separated from the Jews. Hmm. You that for them to do exactly what God said, they had to become Jewish. And that was no small thing for them or for the Gentiles either. So God was going to open the door broader and say, no longer do you have to become Jewish. Now you just have to become Christian. Now you just have to follow Christ. And anyone can follow Christ, Jew, Samaritan, Gentile, and of course, that's what we see in the book of Acts. But that's the essence here, is that uh, because that old system that constituted a wall separating the Jews from the nations, it's going to be taken away. And something more appropriate for the spiritual God of heaven and earth is going to be brought in that is big enough to bring all nations together as his people and turn all of them into his temple, so that the earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the mm-hmm. Lord, like the waters that cover the sea. Yeah, and, and this plays into the story of the Bible, this mm-hmm. idea of a temple uh, in Eden, and then later in the tabernacle, mm-hmm. and then the temples, and then us being the temples shows a personal connection individually between us and God. And then ultimately, in the future, again, a presence of God in our lives. Um, in the future state of the kingdom, right? right. Uh, in the presence I mean, of God, whatever whatever God's ultimate work will be when He has redeemed everything He's going to redeem, the way that the Bible describes it is humanity, redeemed humanity, and God living in a glorious temple, a glorious temple city. Mm-hmm. There's no temple in the city; the city is the temple. Mm. That's what Revelation 21 and 22 says. There's no temple there because the city is the temple. It's God and humanity together. And that's the the end of the Bible story. Well, it's a beautiful picture. Do you have anything that you would like to add to this study before we we end it? No, I I appreciate it. And I, I think it's a great case study in helping us realize the importance of observation before interpretation and interpretation before application. Hmm. If we use passages of Scripture like a, I think of like a little fortune cookie, one little teeny line of text that can fit on a little slip of paper, and you can get used to that if you read verses of the Bible. But the Bible was not given to us in verses. It was given to us in books. Hmm. So don't read, I, I would say, don't even read chapters. Read books. Hmm. that's how the Bible was given. Read it the way God gave it, and you'll be able to appreciate its meaning a lot better. Not the spark, spark notes of the Bible either? No, not that either. <laughs> Just re- take, that's, that's so important. Take the Bible in its own terms. Take the Bible the way God gave it. He gave it in books, not in verses, not in chapters, in books. So take it that way, and the meaning will become much more apparent, and then the application will be sound. And I want to remind our listeners uh, to check out Verse by Verse, which is your podcast that you do on your own, where you are studying right now through the book of Acts. I believe you're chapter 19, Mm -hmm. but knowing you, chapter 19 is maybe 50 episodes. Uh, (laughs) It's quite a few. So there's plenty of content there if you haven't started listening to Verse by Verse. Uh, you can find it on Apple Podcasts. You can find it on YouTube. Just look for or type in Verse by Verse by Clint DeFrance. It will pop right up. Uh, also, The Search, um, which is every Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, it's a live stream, but if you miss it, you can also watch it after the fact. Uh, but that's you and Shahe. And right now you're going through how to study the Bible. And before that, you actually went through the Torah, kind of a 
uh, a study through the major themes of the Torah, and you noted some interesting um, uh, things that happened and some themes and things like that. And I found that very, very helpful. I know many others have as well. Well, thank you. And we, we did talk a lot about the temple in that section. So if people mm-hmm. are interested in this idea of temple imagery, and especially how it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, uh, those studies would be helpful for uh, learning more about that. And that is the search again on, you can listen to it on podcast or you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, Good to look it up as the search with Clint and Shahe. Yes. With with Clint and Shahe. I I usually just do the search with Shahe or the search with Clint and it pops up every time. (laughs) Uh, But anyways, I appreciate you coming on and we'll have you on again in the future. And if anyone has any questions for either myself or Clint, just send me an email at realbiblicalapplication at gmail.com.